Yeah. Welcome to Skeleton Key Productions. I'm Quarren Grows Cocon. Let's get into the video. Today's video will ask some question of what if Biafra gained its independence? Now, many people might not know so know about Biafra, so that's what we're gonna kind of explain in this video. As always, we're gonna go through the history, we're gonna go through the context. But before we get into all that, don't forget to hit the like button, uh, also uh, share and subscribe, etc. etc. Uh, but now we'll, we'll kind of just get straight into that. So sorry about the little plug just then. So, with regards to Nigeria, first of all, the thing to understand is that it's got many, 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 many different uh, ethnicities, right? As a matter of fact, it has over 300 of them, right? So, most of those ethnicities, if you combined all of them up together, would make up roughly about a third of uh, Nigeria's total population, right? So, Nigeria's population is predominantly made up of three different groups, right? So you have in the north, you've got the Hausa, and they make up about 25%. Although people often say that the Hausa and the Fulani, because the Fulani are very similar to the Hausa, they make up, you know, combined, they make up 28%. Then you've got the Yoruba, uh, and they predominantly are in the southwest of the country, and they make up 21% of the total. And then in the southeast, you have the uh, Ibu, and they make up 20.5% uh, of the total uh, Nigerian population. So you see that the, the Hausa, they make up about 70% uh, uh, of like, the northern region. You have uh, in the southwest, you have, again, almost like two thirds or 70% uh, of, of uh, southwest being controlled by the Ibus. And then in the uh, southeast, it's about two thirds or 70% again uh, made up of the Ibu, right? So with all that, this sounds like a recipe for unity and peace and all that stuff, right? No, that's why we're doing this video, right? Because from 1967 to 1970, there was something called the Biafran War or the Nigerian Civil War, depending on like, what stance you take, right? Before kind of getting into all that, we're going to need to step back a little bit and look at like the whole region itself and like, like, like the deeper history of it, right? So first of all, obviously, with these different groups, you have, you know, they're set up in different ways, right? So in the north, you tend to have, you know, they tend to be uh, Muslim. And so the societies there tend to be uh, quite a theocratic. So there's a big emphasis on religious teaching rather than kind of like, quote unquote, Western uh, teaching. That's why like the terrorist group Boko Haram literally means like, you know, Western uh, education is forbidden. Like that's basically what it means. So with regard to that, that's kind of how to look at the north. So for instance, it has a Sharia law. So just as an example, uh, homosexuality in the southern part of Nigeria, you know, you end up getting, I think it's something up to like 10 years in prison. And even for advocating for gay rights, you can get imprisoned. Whereas in the north, you just get the death penalty for being gay. Um, so a little, little bit different, right? Um, but anyway, so that's kind of how the north kind of governs itself along kind of a Sharia like law kind of lines, right? Now, in the southwest, you know, so you had uh, the Yoruba and they tended to be kind of authoritarian, yeah. So you had kings known as Obas, or my pronunciation is going to be really bad, just bear with me, people, just it, it will be really bad, right? So you had like the Obas, right? Uh, and they tended to, you know, they were like kings and stuff and like they tended to, to rule the lands that the Yoruba are controlled and also they tended to be more like native religions, so like kind of uh, so-called animists. So those are the kind of religions that you can kind of describe in the Southwest. Now in the Southeast, yeah, where the Ibus are, well, at a later stage, they tend to be much more Christian uh, than, uh, than the West and certainly more so than uh, the North, but their society tends to be a lot more uh, democratic, right? So it's, it interested me uh, a while ago, there was a, a teacher um, uh, and they said, oh, you know, democracy is like a Western invention and stuff. It's, you know, it's a sign of like Western imperialism, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, okay, so the Ibu had like democracy completely independent of like Western influence, like literally centuries before it ever, you know, so what are you talking about? Okay, well like, so, you know, so like the kingdom of uh, Nuri, uh, so that was uh, from at least like the 10th century. Um, and so you had an elective monarchy, right? So people chose who their king would be, right? Um, and that's how that like, they govern. So it's very much a kind of, uh, it's far less like uh, hierarchical, it was a lot more democratic, a lot more pluralistic, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so obviously in the north, you had a lot more emphasis on piety, and that's kind of like what held you in high regard in society. Whereas in like the southwest, it tends to be more cultural, it tends to be like artistic, it tends to be musical, etc., etc. But for the Ibu, it tended to be more on problem solving and also entrepreneurship, right? So the self-made man, that was what 
uh, the Ibu society kind of like look towards and as we'll get into a little bit later in the video the you know there's many parallels between the Ibu and the Jews right in the sense of both groups were hated for being basically middlemen for being like merchants who would go to other parts like of uh, outside their own regions and be business people and this caused a lot of resentment a lot of uh, hostility and a lot of envy uh, to the local people right who were not as wealthy as they now something to note about uh, Nigeria in the period before colonization is that so in the north you had uh, the Sakato uh, Caliphate and this is basically you know Muslim uh, empire uh, and basically what they end up doing is they end up warring a lot they had jihad against uh, different uh, local groups uh, because they wanted to uh, spread Islam and also as well tied up within all of this uh, Africa just in general uh, took part in the slave trade so obviously Slavery has existed in all different parts of the world, but uh, in terms of you know African slavery, in terms of it spreading outside the rest of the world, obviously you had many people uh, from North Africa and stuff, and like from uh, Arabia who would t uh, take slaves. But then on top of that, of course, you had the Europeans uh, who engaged in the, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, right? And it's estimated that about 14 or 15 percent of the slaves who were brought to the New World by the Europeans came from the Bight of Biafra, right? So the southeast of Nigeria, you know, so like this region which predominantly uh, made up of the Ibo, this is where many of the slaves end up coming from, right? Because, you know, the Kingdom of Nuri and like all the other uh, uh, different uh, uh, tribes and like kingdoms that they had there were not necessarily as strong as uh, some of the, the, uh, the large empires and stuff. So when they would be captured in war and stuff, they'd be sold to the Europeans, right? And so of these millions of people who were uh, transported across uh, 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 the Atlantic Ocean, about two thirds of those who, uh, uh, who came uh, from Biafra, they were put onto British ships and they were sent to British colonies. Yeah? So many people who are African-American, many people who are Afro-Caribbean, many of them, their ancestors would have come from Biafra, right? You know, so fast forward now, quite a few uh, centuries and stuff, uh, obviously, with the regard to the slave trade, uh, so the Europeans tended to just go to the coast and just be like, hey, like, sell us like some slaves and then people further in the interior would go and get the slaves from different tribes and from war and stuff, et cetera, right? But what ended up happening uh, with the abolition of slavery is that, well, first of all, obviously, with the abolition of the slave trade. So first of all, you had uh, the West African Squadron, which is, uh, 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 you know, the Royal Navy basically sending ships to uh, break up uh, uh, the slave trade. So it wasn't just that Britain stopped the slave trade, also stopped other people from having uh, slaves as well. And so as it was kind of like hunting down more and more uh, smugglers and stuff and, and slave traders, what ended up happening is they end up taking more and more territory on the coast of Biafra, right? And just the whole kind of coast of Nigeria in general. So the British ended up taking control over a large part of uh, the coastline. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of how they got established in Nigeria and like they had the uh, kind of foot, first foothold. So now fast forward later on into the 19th century and you had the scramble for Africa. Now, as we've mentioned in other videos, scramble for Africa it had less to do with like different like resources and et cetera, et cetera. And it had more to do with the kind of geopolitical rivalry between the different European powers. So the French, for instance, they wanted to have control over all of West Africa. And so the British in response to this was like, right, we have this territory here along the Nigerian uh, coast. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna move further north and we're going to take as much land north as we can, right? So this meant that the British end up coming into conflict with uh, the Sakato uh, uh, Caliphate, and in, I believe, 1903, they end up uh, defeating them, right? So now you have the Protectorate of Southern Nigeria, and you had Protectorate of Northern Nigeria, and it's named after the Niger River, which uh, goes through uh, Nigeria, right? So as a result of this, you have two colonies where the British were like, hmm, let's think about this, right? So in the Bengal, when we discussed like, you know, the partition of Bengal, like in our video about the partition of India, right? So the problem in Bengal in 1905 was that you had too many people over too large of an area, right? And so the British for administrative purposes there split the territory in half. In this case here, you had the opposite problem because if you've got like southern Nigeria, which is very prosperous, very like, like rich and stuff, yeah, like, you know, great uh, tax revenue, et cetera, et cetera, uh, highly educated population, et cetera. So you've got all that and it has a coastline. Meanwhile, you have northern Nigeria, which is landlocked, 
not many educated people, not great emphasis on like kind of secular education. Uh, and also you have more indirect rule because like uh, you allow basically the, the local emirs uh, to basically run it all and stuff, right? So as we discussed in our previous video as well, uh, you know, the British had various different levels of control that they had in their colonies. So for some places they would have a lot of direct control in other places they kind of let local rulers kind of run things. But in the north you had a large budget deficit because it was hard to collect taxes uh, from uh, from like these emirs and also the north just wasn't very prosperous in the first place, right? So what they decided to do is right, if we combine these two colonies, you know, we have one colony for the price of two, uh, and then what we can do is basically, you know, use some of the tax revenue uh, from the south uh, uh, to fund like projects in the north and stuff, then the colony as a whole kind of makes more sense. So that's what the British kind of did, and that's how they kind of viewed it. However, they didn't take into consideration all the different ethnic groups, all the different religious groups, and what tensions this would cause at a later stage. Now, the unification of the two Nigerias, yeah, this took place in 1914. And then in 1923, you end up having the first elections in Nigeria, right? Yes, as we point out with the uh, India video as well, uh, the British Empire in many of its colonies uh, allowed there to be elections in which uh, some of the locals could vote. And obviously, the franchise was restricted to uh, only property holders or who had a certain amount of money, etc., etc. But still, they end up having uh, uh, elections and stuff, right? So they had a series of elections going all the way through, and then. The one that's like the year just before independence, right? So independence is 1960 for uh, for Nigeria. So by the time we get to the final uh, election uh, during this colonial period, you can already start to see that the different political parties in Nigeria vote basically along ethnic lines, right? So in the southeast, you had the NPNC. I can't remember all the acronyms and stuff, right? <laughs> but the, you know the NPNC, uh, they are in the south. Uh, in the north, uh, you end up having uh, the NPC, so the Northern People's Congress. I remember that one, see. Uh, and then you had uh, the Southwest, uh, which was the Action Group, which was the AG. So, you know, so you've got Ibus who are uh, predominantly voting for the NPNC. You've got Houses who are predominantly voting for the APC, uh, sorry, the NPC. And then, the, you know, the Yorubas are predominantly voting for the AG. So it's all a little bit of a mess and people are not voting along political ideologies as you would for most other parties, they're voting along ethnic lines, right? Which is not really a good recipe for, um, you know, harmony and, and peace and stuff going into independence. And one of the things that annoyed many of the southerners was that, um, you know, in terms of them getting independence, right, the northerners were more uh, hostile to uh, the independence movement because they was like, well, hold on, we're going to end up losing our power. If there's a unified Nigeria, then, uh, you know, the, the central government, the federal government is going to tell us kind of what to do. So Nigeria got its independence with the proviso that the north uh, would be able to kind of govern itself, right? However, many of the policies which the North ended up pushing through was basically what in America you'd call affirmative action, right? So basically having policies where when it came to hiring civil servants, when it came to giving uh, government contracts and stuff, uh, in the North, it went almost exclusively to other Northerners, right? Now, the reason for this is because, you know, as we kind of said, like, you know, the, the Southerners, especially the Southeasterners, tended to have a larger emphasis on education and on, like, kind of more secular kind of uh, um, uh, uh, institutions and stuff, right? So they tended to disproportionately be represented uh, in, like, uh, the Northern, like, governments and, like, within their uh, 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 business kind of uh, uh, interest stuff, right? So you can understand where they were coming from. However, this ended up leading to more tension because it's like you're purposely discriminating against people who are coming from the south, especially from the southeast, right? And as we said before, there was lots of uh, hostility towards uh, uh, the Ibu in particular because like they were seen as kind of parasites. They're seeing, you know, all the same kind of tropes that you see with, uh, with the Jews, wherever they've gone, you end up seeing the same thing with, with the Ibu, right? So it didn't help that a few years later in 1966, there ended up being a coup. Uh, where like the, the leaders of many of the different regions uh, end up being killed and stuff, right? And the leader of this coup was an Ibu, right? Now, the fact that this coup was then crushed by an Ibu didn't really help still because this myth, this kind of poison that uh, the Ibus, you know, they, they control the business, they control this, et cetera, et cetera, they're trying to take over Nigeria, right? So this kind of conspiracy theory spread throughout the whole of Nigeria, right? Um, and 
and end up being uh, pogroms uh, against uh, uh, the um, uh, the Ibu. So up to 30,000 Ibus in northern Nigeria end up being uh, killed. So as a result of this, people in the southeast became very scared, right? They became very uh, like worried that like kind of this new Nigeria wasn't going to protect them, wasn't really going to be here for their interest, and was actually going to be dominated because obviously don't forget that most of the population resided in the north, right? So. For fear of being second-class citizens, many people end up feeling that uh, they needed to get their independence, right? So Colonel Ujuku in uh, 1967 declared unilaterally that Biafra was independent, right? Now, the fact that there isn't a country called Biafra today should tell you about how that conflict ended up going, right? So this is now talking about the Biafran uh, War or as other people might call it, the Nigerian Civil War. And this went from 1967 to 1970. But this conflict is a very confusing one. And so in order to explain this, I'm gonna to have to explain some other things about like the wider world and like decolonization and stuff, right? So hopefully by the end of that, you will understand this conflict a little bit more and how it kind of relates to like wider uh, uh, geopolitics during this period. Right, so first things first, in 1961, South Cameroons end up having a plebiscite and they end up uh, voting to join with the rest of Cameroon, right? So what we have to understand is that, you know, uh, Germany in World War I had Cameroon uh, and after the war it ended up being split between the British and the French, right? So in 1961, South Cameroon ends up splitting away. So this really sets a precedent that a part of Nigeria can split away. And also as well, obviously, South Cameroon is bordering uh, what would later become Biafra. But why is it that we haven't seen, a, you know, decolonization was around like kind of like, you know, like uh, the late 50s, early 60s and stuff, yeah. Why is it that we didn't see an explosion of different separatist movements around? Well, the reason for that is because in uh, 1961 to 63, you had the so-called Congo crisis, right? So this is when Katanga, uh, which is the area in like, uh, the southeast of the Congo, tried to split away from Congo, right? Uh, which had obviously been controlled by uh, the Belgians. On top of that, you also had another part of uh, Congo, which I believe is called like uh, uh, the Orient region. Uh, so I think that's obviously that's in like the east and stuff. So during that crisis, you had a situation whereby the superpowers, because obviously don't forget this is the Cold War and stuff, right? They like for different reasons came to the same conclusion, right? So in the Cold War, where you're competing for different uh, uh, interests and stuff, right? And obviously you're trying to spread your influence. Um, so within like, the Third World, as it was called, you had the, the non-aligned movement. So these are places that want to basically stay on good terms with both the East and the West, right? So the both the Americans and the Soviets are playing a very delicate game here, yeah? Whereby they're not trying to annoy people, yeah, in these newly uh, independent countries, and they're trying to win them over, right? So they're trying to win over the governments of these different places so that they become more uh, within like their sphere of influence, right? So within Congo at that time, you had uh, Patrice Lumumba, uh, he was predominantly kind of, you know, more leaning towards like the Soviet bloc, right? And so Katanga trying to break away from uh, 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 Congo, right? For the uh, Soviets, they was like, no, that's bad, right? We don't want that. And similarly, when it came to the Orient uh, uh, region, right, that was trying to break away from, from the Congo, that was more pro-Soviet. So the Americans were then opposed to it then, right? So what they kind of decided, and the international community in general kind of decided, was that what it was better to do was for the UN to support the nations which already existed, and that if a nation wanted to, you know, if there was a part of a nation which wanted to, in an unconstitutional way, split away from the rest of it, right, that the international community would not automatically side with the secessionist movement, that instead it was to side with the, the, uh, the country which uh, was being broken away from, right? So this is why, although obviously you've had countries which have gained their independence, right, for a long time afterwards, it's been a thing where countries have tended to kind of support them, but it's not an automatic thing where the UN goes, right, you're a new country, right? It ends up being a thing where it's a long process and it, for many different uh, countries, they don't end up supporting that process, right? So with that being in mind, that's kind of the precedence as such, yeah, right? Um, so as a result of that, you know, Biafra splitting away, 
you obviously had the situation where the superpowers, for different reasons, come to the same conclusion where they go, yeah, this isn't really necessarily a good thing. So the Soviet bloc end up supporting uh, the uh, uh, the Nigerian government, yeah, because obviously they're trying to curry favour with the Nigerians and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you expect, being the Cold War, that the British, you know, like if, if the Soviets are taking the Nigerian stance, yeah, right, uh, then the British, because obviously they're friends with the Americans, they must automatically be on the Biafran side, right? No, instead the British in this conflict took the same side as the Soviet bloc, right? Uh, so the British, you know, so a few years before independence in 1958, I believe, the British end up discovering oil in what it was then like kind of Biafra, right? Uh, so they was like, okay, right, we've got a lot of oil here, right? So the companies, uh, Shell and BP, there was like a merger at that point, and so BP stands for British Petroleum. It was a state-owned uh, oil company, which obviously uh, served like Britain's interest in terms of uh, controlling uh, uh, oil. So. 30% of Britain's oil at the time came from Nigeria and 84% of, uh, of the, the oil which was uh, in Biafra was owned by Shell BP. And so as a result of that, it was like, ah, actually what we're going to do, we prefer it to be in the hands of the Nigerian uh, government rather than this new secessionist movement, right? So what we're going to do instead is we're going to back Nigeria. Hopefully the whole thing will be crushed and it will be over by, uh, you know, over like very quickly and then we can get back to business, right? So the British end up taking the Nigerian side. So then the French, obviously, you know, like we've had such a great like kind of uh, friendship with the French and stuff, you know, like you, know, you can really trust in the French. No, just kidding. Uh, the French obviously had their own interests. Um, and as obviously the French have control over uh, most of uh, West Africa, even today, uh, as we've discussed in previous videos, very hands on like the French. Uh, so the French saw this opportunity to spread their influence. Yeah. Uh, within uh, you know, that whole region. And so what they did is they supported Biafra, uh, both militarily and financially. And as a result of uh, French aid, that ended up basically propping up uh, the Biafran state. And as a result, the war went on for much longer than it probably otherwise would, right? So without French support, the Biafran state would have collapsed much, much sooner than it actually did. And also as well, actually something to note is that Colonel Ujuku, uh, he even uh, had plans to uh, change uh, the education system so that in secondary school, French would be taught. And uh, he also said that uh, France had much to offer uh, uh, Biafra, uh, like culturally, etc. So yeah, so he was very much in the camp of like, right, this kind of take uh, Biafra more and more towards uh, the French uh, sphere of influence. So how do you think that the Americans dealt with this, right? Well, the Americans at this time obviously had more than enough on their plate. <laughs> they were embroiled within uh, Vietnam. So they they kind of just was like, well, we're, we're staying out of this, right? However, it is something to note that the Americans in general tended to be more sympathetic towards the Biafrans, right? Although officially they took the stance of being neutral in this conflict. You know, so the Americans, they end up deciding to be neutral because, yeah, while the Russians were supporting uh, the Nigerians, it was a situation where, you know, if the British are supporting the Nigerians and the French are supporting the Biafrans, if you take either one of those sides, then, like, you know, either the British are going to be annoyed at you or the French are going to be annoyed at you and it's going to weaken the overall uh, Western alliance. So as a result of that, they kind of just stayed out of it. It was a very complex, kind of messy uh, situation. So, yeah, they kind of stayed out of it. Well, it's something to note that of all people, Tricky Dicky, yeah, he personally uh, was very much, uh, like, sympathetic towards the Biafran cause. And also, as well, there was a US student uh, who was called Bruce uh, Mayrock, and he actually set himself on fire in 1969. So, yeah, he died as a result of that out of protest to what the Nigerian government was doing. Uh, we'll get on to that in a little, little bit with regard to what the Nigerian government did during this conflict, right? But for now, we're just going to keep talking about international kind of support. So the Americans are neutral, the British and the, the Russians on, on like the, the, the Nigerian side. Uh, with regard to the Biafran side, so France, you got Israel, China as well, because uh, China, during this time, there was a Sino-Soviet split, so like the Chinese and the Russians weren't getting on, so the Chinese decided to just back the, the, the Africans just to be spiteful. Um, uh, also as well, you had a handful of uh, African uh, countries, so you had uh, Tanzania, you had uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which is the Ivory Coast, you had uh, Gabon, and you also had uh, Zambia. And outside of Africa, you've had uh, Haiti, uh, which were also in support of, uh, of uh, uh, Biafra, but with the exceptions of, of those, like the rest of the the world kind of just stayed out of it or took the Nigerian side. 
you know, and even the Organization for African Unity, which later obviously became the African Union, even for them, yeah, like they took a stance of we're supporting the Nigerian government, right? And what the Nigerian government did in this war, some people have referred to it as a genocide. I don't think that it necessarily fits the, 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 the bill in terms of like the, the actual definition. However, what I will say is that it certainly was a war crime, right? Because what the Nigerian government did is basically they did, they turned the entire of uh, the entirety of Biafra into what amounts to a medieval seed, right? You know, in war it makes sense to obviously blockade like arms coming through and stuff, right? But what they did was they blocked food and medicine coming uh, through to uh, Biafra, and as a result. Two million people, mainly children, end up starving to death in this war, right? So the idea we have of, you know, the, the image we have of uh, the starving African, you know, with like flies buzzing around and huge pot, uh, pot bellies, that came from the Biafran uh, conflict, right? That image has been seared into Western minds as a result of that. Just to, just to give a little bit of perspective, right? So 15% of the uh, uh, population of Biafra starved to death in this war. It'd be the equivalent in Britain if 10 million people end up starving to death. And if it was in America uh, today, it would be the equivalent of about 50 million people starving to death, right? So, you know, if America was having a civil war and the way that the American government dealt with it was by starving to death 50 million of its own people, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think, I think uh, public opinion would uh, not exactly be in favour of that, right? But um, anyway, so that ended up happening. And the problem with with, with uh, like Biafra coming independent is obviously it had its own currency, and when the war was over, the people there obviously all their savings had now been put into this new money, and there was no way of converting it back. So what ended up happening is the Nigerian government, kind of as a peace offering in a way, well some people say it's peace offering, some people say it's not so much. What they did is they said, right, we're going to give each uh, individual in Biafra. 20 pounds right 20 nigerian pounds now it's quite difficult for me to work this out because you know uh, so you had the naira which came later and stuff but at that time it's called the nigerian pound and as far as i'm aware it had a one-to-one -one parity with the british pound uh, so by trying to work it out that way it's very very confusing right but it's about the equivalent of about 227 pounds if you convert that to dollars, that's roughly about almost $300. So bearing in mind that Nigeria at this point, its GDP per capita was almost 1700 right? This means that, you know, this isn't even, you're not even giving people the average, right? So the middle class, the upper class uh, within uh, Biafra, completely, all their savings completely wiped out and stuff, right? And so they're, everyone's receiving this money, which is, you know, 20% almost what the average person was getting, right? What I will say with this is, obviously, over the decades, right, the, you know, the Nigerian government made a lot of efforts to kind of, like, bring uh, this region more into the thing. And also now you have a Nigerian nationalism a lot more now. So especially with the younger generation, from what I can kind of work out, there doesn't seem to be a big push for uh, Biafran uh, independence stuff. It seems that that independence movement has kind of died down. Um, uh, obviously, that could change over time as well. But it seems to me now that the situation has largely resolved itself in a more peaceful way over time but there still was obviously the reckoning of how it was dealt with and still those underlying issues with regard to the different ethnic groups and different religious groups within Nigeria there still is a lot of division still is a lot of tension and stuff but anyway we're going to talk now now that we've talked about like the whole history of it and stuff right we're going to talk now about what would have happened if Biafra had gained its independence yeah so that's the what if now for the video so before we talk about the what if, we have to talk about what might have gone differently and what would have had to have gone differently in order for them to have gained independence. And I think the main thing is that the British would have had to recognise Biafra and have thrown their weight behind uh, Biafra. Because if they had supported Biafra, it would have allowed Biafra to have uh, become independent. Uh, but then it would have had consequences throughout the rest of the Commonwealth and throughout the rest of like what was left of the Empire and stuff, right? So. Long term, I think that it would have had a lot of repercussions if the British had done this, but 
the only way that I think that the Biafrans might have won is if that had happened, because then if the British had been on the same side, then the French might have got involved a little bit, but like they would have had to play in se uh, second fiddle. And then also the Americans, although obviously they were embroiled in Vietnam, they would have come out and given a lot more support uh, for the Biafran state. So, you know, Biafra and Nigeria would be very uh, tense neighbours. Uh, even today, there could potentially still be a lot of that rivalry. We can see this now with uh, Sudan. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the South Sudan split away in 2009. South Sudan and like the rest of Sudan are still very hostile to each other. And you can also see the same tensions with Ethiopia and Eritrea, where even though an Eritrea got its independence in 1993, there still is a lot of tension between the two of them. Also, what I think is that there would be a lot more secessionist movements uh, throughout the whole of Africa. Obviously, there's a lot of secessionist movements. Virtually every country has its own little secessionist uh, movement stuff. But I think like the precedent which was set by the uh, Congo crisis, I think would have been immediately undone by the Biafran one. And I think a lot more countries would have just, you know, torn themselves apart and stuff. Especially if the uh, Organisation for African Unity, if they had come out in favour of secession, uh, then eventually the UN would have as well and I think you'd have a lot more independent countries in the world today but I think if it's not done in a very peaceful way in a very democratic way I think it would have caused a lot of uh, conflicts and a lot of uh, strife throughout like, the whole of uh, the African continent although at the same time the borders would better reflect the people there rather than it just being the legacy of what some uh, European bureaucrat uh, drew over a hundred years ago. So with that being said, I hope that you enjoyed that video. You know, as we always say, uh, don't forget to hit the like button uh, and also share with your friends. Uh, the next video is going to be on uh, Catalonia and uh, what if Catalonia became independent. So obviously I can imagine in the comment section, it's going to be very, very heated there, but that's what this channel is all about. It's all about having, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries and getting people thinking. So with that being said, have a great day and bye.